And one of the amazing things about these meetings is that we're all on different lands. Um, and I'm on the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation being in Sydney at the moment. Um, our office, for those of us, the people who might be in the SCIA office, is on Darawal land. Um, and all of you will be on a variety of lands as well. If you don't know, I encourage you to look it up. It's always really interesting. Um, and th then I would also like to... Um, um, pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting, to pay my respects to Elders past and present, to recognise the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and culture and connection to land and waters of Australia. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do a bit of an introduction because for those of you who have become be, been coming to these forums since we started our representative advocacy you will see a sea of new faces um, and people you might not know and some of you might also be thinking well where's tony um, so for those of you who don't know me firstly my name is susie stoles now um, i've been working at scia for five years um, but I, um, but I'm also new to um, the advocacy. So I've been working in our inclusion, resilience, outcomes, and social impact space, and closely with the peer support team. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, Tony hung up his SCIA boots after many years service, um, just before or just after Christmas um, last year, um, and we miss him greatly. He, we, with him, we lose a awful lot of knowledge. Um, Tony had a giant big brain with lots of history with SCIA and we miss him a lot. Um, there's some big shoes to fill. Um, my background pre-SCIA was not disability. Um, it was, however, representative advocacy. So I'm excited to be taking on um, leadership of this team. Um, I worked at St. Vincent de Paul Society leading the, the advocacy. We animated the voice of the thousands and thousands of members. And so what I want to do with you guys in this role is animate your voices because collectively um, we, can, we can have a brain as big as Tony's. Um, so we're going to be using your skills and your knowledge um, to bring us forward in the representative advocacy space. And Gordana and I will talk a little bit more about that later. So it'll be very exciting. Um, so Gordana, I will hand over to you to introduce yourself as well. Hi, I'm Gordana and I've been working for, for SCIA since November last year. Um, I've been working in the disability sector for over 45 years and um, in my last role I worked with ADAC and I used to manage the um, community support program um, before it rolled into the NDIS and previous to that I've had several roles in the community as well, managing um, community centres as well as um, disability organisations. I've worked in group homes and I've worked on a one-to-one -one with people with disability. Um, I'm very excited to be working for SCIA. Um, for me, it gives me an opportunity to give back as well because I've had a very rewarding career out of working with people with disabilities. So it's an opportunity for me to be able to give back. So I'm really excited about working with Susie and I'm excited about the changes that we're about to implement as well. We also are lucky enough to have Dion with us, which is a new role in our organisation. Dion, would you like to introduce yourself and your work? I have said, year and do, my name is Dion Co. Yiridu Marang, which is good day in my language, in Radri language. I'd like to pay respects to my people where I'm sitting in Maradri country and all over. Um, my role here is to advocate for um, First Nations people in Australia. Um, um, when I come on board, I think Tony, he was my um, supervisor at the time, and I um, took this role on and didn't know how it looked until I got into it. Now, I think it's currently looking a bit different. Um, I've already been, I'm already out in the communities because that's where I deliver the services better and advocate better. Um, I've been out in the community actually since I first started. Um, I started on the 13th of November. Um, myself, I have my own business um, where I run on the side. I'm an Aboriginal consultant, consult, and I also do, I'm an artist. And I'm renowned for creating the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council logo when I was 13 years old. So. I've been around for a while and I know what I'm doing, especially when it comes to do with Aboriginal people. I'm um, talking about disability. That isn't in my vocabulary, as I explained to my colleagues. That's not, um, that's a non-Indigenous word. We don't, didn't see our people as um, 
having a disability. We've seen them with just needing extra support or extra help because I had a great grandmother and I had cousins, so I wouldn't be wanting to tell them that they had a disability. So my word for disability wasn't what a non-Indigenous person uses. Like I said, it doesn't come from the Radri vocabulary. Um, I've worked extensively within communities. Um, I started work, I walked out of high, doing my exams at high school and walked straight into the job the next day. So I've been working since I was 17 years old. Across the board, youth, disability, health, legal, um, just, I don't know, anywhere that um, Aboriginal people need help is where I've jumped in and um, I suppose <clears throat> helped. Um, being with SCIA, um, I actually very much enjoy the job. Um, helping people that need help um, and helping people understand as being an Aboriginal person there is um, <clears throat> somewhere across the lines where maybe discrimination comes in and people with a, with a disability are affected by that sometimes so I do understand some things like that. There are other things that um, I have done, um, work with preschools, um, I go into schools and teach culture um, and hopefully maybe um, SEIA take that on too, where I teach um, culture um, to them so they're aware of what um, how Aboriginal people um, live and um, discuss things, I suppose. Thank you, Dion. Liala. Uh, so my name is Liala Cadelli. I'm a uh, physical therapist as a background. I joined Spinal Core Injury Australia last year to work in an interesting project on person-centered emergency preparedness that we are going to run also in the next couple of months. Um, as a background, again, I'm a physical therapist and always work in natural disaster work, work context, supporting people with disability in different projects. I'm really happy to have this new team, even if I miss a lot, Tony. And I'm really looking forward for the network forum today, of today, considering the big revolution that will be within NDIS. Thank you. Thank you, Liala. Uh, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Godana. I should mention Greg, um, who most of you know is still part of our team as well. He's just on leave at the moment, um, and he'll be doing some of the work to animate the representative voice into systemic, um, like he has always done, and I'll be doing that with him as well. Um, so housekeeping. I'm sure you guys know all these things. I'll be really quick. Um, if possible, if you have a question or want to make a comment, use the raise hand feature. Um, we'll try and aim for one person speaking at a time um, so we can all hear and make hear answers. Um, please, if you're not talking, mute your microphone so we don't have any background noise. Um, we know the meeting's being recorded, but for anyone who came late, the meeting's being recorded and will be put on the resource library. So if you're not comfortable with your camera, um, we'll be taking notes that we can share um, and this is a safe space so I we have said it remains confidential and I looked at that this morning and thought confidential except we're posting it online um, so we do need to know it probably wasn't the best sentence um, it is a safe space we want to be caring and respectful of each other um, it is however being posted online so that other people can watch who haven't had time so it is confidential-ish um, Go down if you want it to flip to the next screen. Today we're going to talk about the NDIS internal review. Now we're going to talk um, just about the areas that we think are most pertinent to our members. That doesn't mean that you can't raise other things as well. So Gordana will present um, the things that we think will have most impact on the lives of, of you guys. Um, we're also going to talk about the aged care reforms and give you an update. Of course, that's been going for a long time, but there's quite a lot of consultations that are coming about at the moment. Again, we just pick certain things that we think are relevant, but there's heaps of time for chat in this mix. So if there are things you want to raise, things that are important that haven't been covered, then there's lots of time for you to do that as well. Um, representative advocacy also we want to share what we've been doing we've had the online network survey so Gordana will share that the plans for um, our representative advocacy advisory group like I, I sort of highlighted we really want to start to utilize your knowledge better um, and have you feeding into this a little bit more um, and we want to be able to update you as well on some other things that have been happening at SCIA um, so Without further ado, 
I think the next slide, Gordana, is over to you and we'll start talking about NDIS. I'll start off with the NDIS review highlights. So in December last year, the NDIS review final report was released. So that contains 26 recommendations and 138 detailed actions, which if adopted by government would have a huge overhaul on the services for people with disability in Australia. These recommendations show us how the NDIS want to deliver a more uniform, accessible and inclusive system of supports for all people with disability, including those who are under 65 and not eligible for the NDIS. We believe that many of the recommendations, if done well, should have positive outcomes for people with disability. There are others, however, that could have negative, possibly unintended consequences. Before we start, I just want people to remember that at this stage, these are just recommendations. They have not been adopted by government as yet. These reforms, if adopted, will be implemented over a five-year period with a promise that there will be opportunities for people with disability, their families, carers and other representatives to co-design how this new system will look like. Here are some of the highlights. So they've said that all of government has agreed to set up foundational supports for all people with a disability under 65. NDIS participants over 65 should be able to receive supports from the NDIS and the aged care system at the same time so they can better be supported as they age. There is also a call on governments to speed up making mainstream services more inclusive and accessible for people with disability. There is a recommendation to replace support coordinators, local area coordinators and psychological recovery couches with navigator roles. These roles will sit outside of the NDIS and they will be available for all people under 65 as they need them and if their circumstances change. The panel also recommended improving access to make it easier for people with psychosocial conditions to, set, to get support when they needed it and for the NDIS to find better ways of being able to work with mental health services to improve current supports. They also intend to work with First Nations people with disability to improve NDIS supports. They're also looking at alternative commissioning in rural and remote locations. What this means is they want to make an arrangement. They, they want to look at what services are missing in those areas and then work with the local communities and people with disability and their support networks to be able to meet the needs of that local community. And there was also a call for all of government to agree and share the cost of the system to better meet the supports of people with disability. As you can see, these are just some of the highlighted recommendations from the review that would make positive changes for people with disability. Now I'm going to make some recommendations that could have an impact on people with spinal cord injuries and neurological conditions. For today, I will only cover four of the recommendations. As this rolls out, we intend to be able to provide more opportunities for people to be able to discuss these recommendations going forward. The first recommendation that I'm going to talk about is fundamental supports and mainstream services. I've included these because there's a lot of activity happening around this area at the moment. Um, what fundamental support um, means is that the NDIS won't be the only place that people with disability under 65 can get support from. NDIS participants under 65 will be able to access these this supports and those over 65 will be able to access aged care supports. Foundational supports, I know we, I just realised I've been calling them fundamental supports, I'm so sorry. It's an internal joke that we had and I said I'd, I wouldn't do it and I did it. Foundational supports will also be available for those under 65 not eligible for the NDIS. Recently an agreement was struck between the Commonwealth, State and Territory Governments to invest in foundational supports. They proposed that these supports will be developed over a five-year period. In addition, they also the government also announced that there's going to be 11.6 million to develop a foundational support strategy to be considered by National Cabinet in the second half of this year. This is what I mean that there's activity happening in these areas that that are coming about and we want to make sure that we're involved in some of this work as well. This strategy will be led by the Department of Social Services and would be informed by people with disability, families and carers and researchers. It also recommended that an advisory group consisting of people with disability and disability representative organisations like SCIA be established. So let's talk about what are fundamental supports. The review panel wanted a connected system of supports for all people with disability. The idea is that people with a disability would be in a connected system that would include accessible and inclusive mainstream services, foundational supports, supports from a navigator, and if eligible, individual supports funded through the NDIA. 
the panel stated that fundamental support should improve inclusion, increase social and economic participation, and ensure that people with a disability will get the services that they needed. So there are two types of support that they're recommending. The first one is general support, which will be available for all people with a disability. And this will include navigator support, programs and activities like information and advice, individual and family capacity building, peer support, advocacy, self-advocacy and disability employment. And then there's targeted support. These supports will only be available for those under 65 not eligible for the NDIS. These services will include home and community care, aids and equipment, early childhood supports, psychological supports and supports for adolescents and young people. The panel further stated that for fundamental supports to work effectively, there needed to be an accessible and inclusive mainstream supports. And the proposal for mainstream supports is really most welcome. The review identified that people with disability continue discrimination and barriers participating in, commun in the community and when accessing Main Street services like health, mental health, education, services offered by local councils and supports offered by community organisation. The panel recommended that the government needed to speed up making mainstream services more inclusive and accessible. The report also requested stronger connection between mainstream services and, and, and the NDIS and that they become more person-centred and easier to navigate. At this stage, there's not a lot of information from government about foundational support. However, advocacy groups are already working on priority projects for this recommendation and SCIA has been actively participating in these workshops. If adopted by all government, these are very positive steps in the right direction. There are, however, some issues that we've identified about foundational support and mainstream services and these include there are currently so few services available for people with disability outside the NDIS so planning to meet service gaps is really important. People with disability, their families, carers and their communities and representatives need to be at the centre of these reforms and they need to be the key influencers and drivers in the, in the types of supports and services they need. Foundational supports are reliant on mainstream services being more accessible and inclusive. This is really interesting because the, there are concerns that mainstream services can continue to drag their feet, as is the case now. There is also concern that there will be a push for people over 65 to use aged care services that already have huge waiting lists. We want, to, we want a quality response for people with psychosocial disability so that these support meet people's needs and don't continue, don't have these people continue to fall through the gaps. Support needs to be funded for the long haul, not as one-off short-term projects. Okay, I know that was a lot of information, but um, here's an opportunity for you guys to actually, um, have we have we actually covered some of these concerns? Can people um, also have come back to us and, and see if they've got other recommendations or other concerns around this area? So it's an opportunity to talk. Particularly about foundational supports, but Diane, yep. I know you also had your hand up for a question. Yes. Yeah, my hand's been up for a little while, but what's my thing is, um, <clears throat> I know what um, Gordana is saying, that NDIS are saying this, okay? But in my communities, it's not happening. Yeah. What I'm trying to explain to you is, they're chucking my mob straight on the aged care as soon as they're 50 and trying to shut them down from getting NDIS. Now, I think that's a bit unfair here. And it's happening all over. I've got two people over here and that live here. She got put on aged care before she was even asked, talk, talk to, spoken about aid, um, NDIS. She just turned 60. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this is the sort of treatment my people get out here. This is why I'm assuming Tony knew that I was going, and, and um, Judith and I knew I was going to be a good advocate because I'd find out this information. There's also a lot of corruption because they think that Aboriginal people in remote areas can't complain and stuff like that, or it takes a long time for a complaint going on when they're not, um, the NDIS plan isn't working towards to meet their needs, proper needs. So um, in my area, <clears throat> I haven't got a lot of faith in, in NDIS at the moment because of what I've been hearing in my communities. So I just wanted to put that out there so people know what's going on in the Aboriginal or First Nation communities. Thank you. Thank you, Deanne. Um, Gordana as Deanne, darling. Yes, thank you. Thank you, darling. Does anyone else have any um, thoughts on foundational supports? Do we think it's a good thing? Have you got any concerns? Um, when you heard about it, is there anything that sort of, you know, might impact you that we haven't thought of? I think Claire wants to say something. 
Sorry, I was just going to comment on that. And I, I think there's currently a rural regional uh, NDIS um, submission that you can put in. I'm not sure if, if Skia knows of that. Um, and that would give you the opportunity to raise some of those issues uh, that, I, that I've heard about. So I, could, I can pass that on to you, the, the link to that um, opportunity. I think it closes, at, it might close this Friday though. So um, it's it's pretty tight, but yeah, I'll, I'll send it across anyway. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Gordana, there is also David. Yeah, sorry, yeah, guys, I can't actually see. So maybe yep. if David um, L. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm not much of a voice. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes, David. Okay. Right. Uh, I've damaged vocal cords because of the blood pressure. But what are those foundation supports? So I then I became a Spinal cord injury at 68. Been struggling for three years since 20. Mm. Really struggling. And I don't get much help from it. Turning off from the NDS. So I won't do I do. to be in the nursing home. There's nowhere else to go. That's not really soon. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think that's something that yeah. will really come up in the next section as well, David. You cut in and out. I don't know, Gordana, if you caught all, yeah. David, after saying we could hear you, you cut out a tiny yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think what I heard was that um, by the time this gets into put into place, you possibly could be in a nursing home. That's the way I, I did it. Oh, you are in a nursing I home already. Okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not really, it's not right. Not right. mm. 20 years older than me. Mm. Uh, I think that's yep. where we can really strongly advocate in the next section is about the aged care um, and, you know, um, and the plans in that section. I think that's something I think has always been a priority advocacy area for SCIA, David, um, and something we're really keen um, to get on with this year. Yeah. Because it is not fair. Robin? Yeah, hi. Um, I guess my concern is um, they're recommending that, you know, the foundational supports um, will be in place in five years. Mm. Um, five years seems like a long time, but I'm, I'm not convinced that that's really going to be long enough. Mm. And in particular in regional areas, where um, supports are very thin on the ground now, um, yep. they will have to do an awful lot of work, I think, in in those regional areas to um, to increase um, any supports there. Yeah, I just wanted to express my mm. opinion, yeah. I guess. I agree with that as well. Like. You know, in terms of regional, um, in the regional areas, I mean, you know, it's one thing saying we're going to put money towards it, but you've got to have the resources there in the first place or, or at least the human resources to be able to actually do the work as well. You know, yeah, and, we're looking um, at thin markets as well. Yeah, infrastructure as well. Yes, exactly. And that could very much form a, a advocacy line that we take as well in re regional yep. areas. So I think that's a really important comment, Robin. Mm. It's good. Thanks. Mark Tonga, I think. No? Did you put your hand down, Jerry? Mark? Yeah. Jerry. Yeah. Jerry. Um, I was sort of thinking about the same thing until Robin brought it up. I was sort of going to mention that I've actually come from, as Susie knows, because we've talked before about rural connection. Um, I came from a like a Western three hours inland, so that I guess that's rural regional to rural mm. coastal. And even though there's more resources here to spread around, there's more people to use those resources. So I think, yeah, I'd like be interested to see where that goes in terms of, of what both Robin and Gordana and Susie were just saying. You know, I'd, I'd be interested to mm. see what happens with that aspect that um, from where I was um, discussing that, 
the same issue is that they don't tend to replace the resources once they're lost. So sometimes yep. it's about fighting to keep what's there as well as adding to it and, and worrying that, about, yeah. And Jerry, and that's exactly what happened when they set up the NDIS, all these services. Yeah. Some of these services were really amazing and they just dried up. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The continuity of service provision and laying a good foundation for service provision mm -hmm. are things that we really need to make sure we're speaking up about. And no short-term projects, please. We've seen <laughs> so many of those in the past. <laughs> okay, are we ready to go on to the next section? Okay, so the next section I'll be talking about is housing options and supported and shared accommodation. We know that good housing and living supports are fundamental for social, economic and community participation and that they encourage independence and strengthen connections with family, friends and community. People with disability must have a choice and control over where they live, who they live with and how they live. However, even after 10 years of the NDIS, there are still people with a disability who have no choice and control about who they live with and where they live. Also in the past 10 years, there have been no innovation in housing and living support design. And even though some investment was made, there is still not enough housing to, pe to meet people's needs. The government has recently announced that they will be investing 49 million for immediate steps on recommendations for improved home and living options. Details regarding what this looks like have not yet been released. The review identified that there was a need for fairer and consistent housing and living support that encourages choice. To achieve this, the panel recommended funding housing and living supports in a fair way and letting people with disability choose how they want to live, providing people with disabilities to support at key stages to explore options, secure housing and a living budget, and providing people living in shared accommodation support to help them to have a say in how the home, how their home and their supports are organised. And there was also a proposal for a 24-7 living support that generally should be funded at a ratio of one support worker to three participants. In addition, there is a lack of accessible and affordable mainstream housing in Australia. This is a huge impact on people with high support needs who are on fixed and low incomes. To remedy this, the panel recommended the development of a dedicated housing plan under Australia's disability strategy and that adoption of the living, livable housing design standard in the National Construction Code would improve general housing stock, making it accessible for people with disability. To achieve this, a commitment to the livable housing design standard under the National Construction Code was recommended. For a while now, SCARE and other advocacy groups such as the Physical Disability Council of New South Wales have been pushing for an increase in the availability available supply of accessible and adaptable housing through the National Construction Code. At this stage, New South Wales and Western Australia are the only two states that have not yet adopted the livable housing standard. We have also been pushing for improved alternative housing options to provide greater flexibility and choice in housing for people with disability. Now that the opportunity to push back has become available because of this review, our intention is to resurrect this campaign. Apart from the concerns that I've already mentioned, what are some of your other concerns around the around these recommendations? And does anybody have concerns around the one to three ratio? Uh, I'm curious around that. <coughs> the Cordana, um, guys, just um, how what Cordana is saying, um, what people find if um, um, Aboriginal or First Nations people find if they have to travel um, to Sydney to have operations and stuff like that, or to see a specialist um, and finding accommodation. That's the main um, aim. That's yeah. the main thing with that amongst us. And then being able to live in their own communities because it's important mm -hmm. that they stay um, in their own country and that's not something that's possible. So they have a lot of um, people had to move out of their own t hometowns and go to bigger towns or move to Sydney where there's more support systems. So that becomes a problem because it's not the... Um, the housing, it's a lack of support in the remote areas. Mm -hmm. So um, I was talking to Hana um, about stuff like that. So um, we could open eyes, just not just with the advocacy, but across um, SCIA, so they understand what's going on. So that was a problem that 
um, some people coming from remote areas or from country and having operations and going to Sydney and not having nowhere to stay. Like they got to go on their own and then they can't have family around to support while they're in operations. Yeah. And then having to move out of their own country, which I'll, I'll tell you, does a big, does a lot to them. It takes a lot from them from moving. You know, they got a dis, they got a disability, then they're expected to move. So that does a lot to them too. Also, so that's a that's a, seems to be a problem. Yeah, and did you did you say before that it's also the lack of support? So they yeah. might have housing, but not necessarily the support needed to. Yeah, yeah. Like what I'm going to explain some. <clears throat> you might be in a right area, okay, and there might be only one lot of support workers that do something. Like they might only come in and clean your house. If um someone says um a lady says speaks like what happened was I had somebody that um accidentally wet herself and the support worker was leaving until another support worker that was coming in. What had happened? Oh, you're, just, you're going to have to think because she just wet herself. But she couldn't help the lady to the toilet. It took, would have took her a minute to help mm. her to the toilet, you know, okay. things like that. And she didn't want to say mm. anything because if she, that support, she's in a remote area, that support don't come back, she's not going to get any help. Mm. So things like that are happening. All right. Thank you. David L. Yeah. yeah. I hear what you're saying about First Nations. People are most sympathise with that, but it's for everybody. I have the same difficulty. I'm in Olbar in Utara coast, and I have to leave my country as well, to go to Sydney or somewhere else. So it works both ways. It's not just about First Nations. It's about all of us. We're all together in this. If we're disabled, we're all one, not separate. Thank so, you, David. So David's saying he's, ha he's having the same issues as well and that we're all in together in this, including First Nations people as well as people who live in remote areas. Yeah, I understand that. But I'm, I was just, um, I'm the one that's advocating for First Nations people. That's yeah. only I can speak on behalf of them, David. So that was why I'm speaking on behalf of the, my people. Thank you. It's interesting. I think that's not something that always comes up into housing, but I've heard that a lot of times over the mm. last five years, travel for medical to big cities yeah. and that's housing too. So I don't know yeah. if that's something that other people are finding is an enormous gap and worth us speaking up about because I've, I've heard a lot myself. Yeah, I've actually come up with that myself recently from a personal perspective is that I have very specific needs now that I'm um, dealing with braces and KFOs and a lot of places you're booked in to stay or that you've um, sourced might not be available, you can't get in and you have a real problem trying to find somewhere to stay overnight or, or even a few days to see specialists even if it's literally an hour and a half away it's a big deal and it makes a big difference and if those options aren't there even you know you might have been once able to uh, rent a small unit or something for a couple of days that those options aren't there anymore and it's sort of the same thing with the rural thing the services go and they're not back again uh, and also I suppose extra housing issues um can be affected by things like uh, emergency preparedness, like what happened in Lismore with the flooding. There's mm -hmm. still, here we are years on from that major event. Um, they're having to extend the pod housing and everything because there's just not enough housing. I mean, I was in a doctor's surgery recently in Ballina and uh, there was a lady there who literally just suffered a spinal cord injury, didn't even realise she had one and was trying to navigate a new spinal cord injury in a caravan. So, and had just wow. been through the flood, lost a home. And so there's a lot in that. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. It's a shortage of available accommodation, especially in rural areas. Did anyone have any feedback? Okay. Gordana, you asked about the ratios. Oh, yeah, the one to three ratios. It's interesting because I remember when I used to work in the sector in the group homes back in the 80s, that, that were the ratios. <laughs> it was one to three, unless there was something that um, required more support. And then we used to have people just come in for, for individual bits of um, periods as well to support the staff. Okay. Shall we move on? Thank you, everyone. Okay, the next session yes. should be Sorry, really. Donna. David, yes. I think. Yes, uh, David. 
let us say in the nursing homes, one to ten. Okay. So there you go. And I'm assuming that is not comfortable, David. Is no. something that <laughs> always. I was thinking, David, it certainly wouldn't ne necessarily meet any of your needs being in the nursing home with that kind of ratio. I mean, how much, how many people actually come to visit you um, during a shift? Oh, if I call them. Only if I call them. Yeah. No one else comes in. Um, the thing is, they do, they do, they're always busy and they do a good job. I know they're flat out. But, mm. but really, not adequate because yep. people aren't believe enough to do the job. I mean, I, I, I'm wondering if their answer to that was the extra nursing staff that they would put in. I think there's a lot of work in that space with nursing home that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank Jerry. You oh, sorry, sure. David. All right. People just don't understand. It's one mm -hmm. quick. They need to be trained. So. Yeah. Thank you, David. Jerry. Uh, I think I just forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Robin. Robin. A oh, Robin. Okay. Robin, yeah, please. Hi. Yeah, just on the the ratio thing, I think it can be that can be so difficult, can't it? Like it mm. it depends on the the person's disability, really. You know, and if I'm thinking of you know someone with um. A spinal cord injury if they're living in a group home for example you know and they might have an incident <clears throat> mm. a bowel accident perhaps you know I yep. mean it's there's got to be some flexibility surely and and looking at um the individual's needs I think yeah mm. yeah yeah, I agree. I'm totally agree with you, Robin. I think it it really depends on the needs of the person. Mm. So if we are now promoting this idea of kind of a tailored intervention, it's it's quite tricky to give this generic number without analyzing the single situation, yeah. the needs of that individual. So I'm, I'm totally agree with you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you as well. And, and I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, how much more negative publicity do we need around, you know, appropriate supports and appropriate care? So, yeah, this will be an interesting space to, to watch how this pans out in terms of group homes and that type of thing. Uh, Jerry. Yeah, I was just going to say with that, there's a big gap between, like there's a big disparity between possible practice and best practices there. Yeah. It's always going to be an argument there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we move on? Okay. So the next one that I'm going to talk about is registration of providers. I, I think this, for me, this is one of the most controversial areas because it could have a huge impact on people um, who self-manage. So the port, report recommends a new model of mandatory registration or enrolment for all providers with full level of provider registration. This risk proportionate regulation means that participants would only be able to use NDIS registered and enrolled providers in the future as they will no longer be able to pay them. In addition, mandatory worker screening will cover all registered providers and workers of enrolled providers that directly deliver specific services or those who have more than an incidental contact with a person with a disability. So the four levels are advanced registration. So this covers um, areas like group homes, so where there's a high level of technical competence and inherently high level of, of skill as well required. The one that I think is going to have a huge impact on most of our members will be the general registration. So this is for medium risk supports that include supports such as high intensity daily personal care activities, supports that require additional skill and training such as complex bowel care, injections and supports involving significant one-to-one -one contact with people with disability. 
And then there's the basic re registration for lower risk supports, which include sole traders and smaller organisations, such as those providing social and community participation, supports including limited one-to-one -one contact with people with disabilities. And then enrolment, this is for all providers in the low risk category. So these are the providers who provide your consumables, your equipment, your technology and home and vehicle modifications. We do have concerns related to these recommendations, the first being that being registered does not guarantee that people with a disability will receive a high quality of care. People with disability are concerned that the proposed registration scheme will limit the choice and control over their ability to continue using known and trusted unregistered providers and sole traders, spelling the end of self-managed NDIS supports. This issue also includes providers who support the additional needs of groups of people with disability, like people from First Nations and those who are culturally and linguistically diverse. Added to this, Registration is costly and lengthy process and would be a deterrent for currently unregistered providers. This may lead to a significant loss of trusted providers and support workers from already thin markets. It is also unclear how enrolment will work for mainstream retailers who provide consumables who are going to be subject to worker screening requirements. There are concerns that this will create barriers getting the best value of money on consumables and other goods, meaning that prices for these goods will increase as the ability to purchase them at a lower price will disappear. SCIA has recommended in their feedback to the Disability Advocacy Network Australia that further consultation with people who are utilising the self-managed model needs to be had before the NDIA decides to progress down this path. As we believe that the outcomes that best suit people with disability, their families and carers, needs to be co-designed with them. And there should have been, you know, when I look at this, that's what I mean unintended, um, what I meant before when I said that there were unintended consequences. There should have been, um, there should have been an actual uh, consultation on this with people who were actually using, using um, the self-managed models. So um, does this capture your concerns and are there any others that you're aware of or if you want to comment on the on the options that I provided as well? Okay, David. Hello, am I? Hi. You can hear me? Good. Um, yes. Yeah, I would be very concerned about that. I think uh, registration for all providers would be a big mistake uh, because uh, it would just open up a can of worm or an opportunity rather for people to uh, overcharge. And I think that's already rife in the industry now. Mm -hmm. And if it's an open playing field, I think that will actually decrease the cost for providers in the long term. And I guess, David, there's a reason why 60% of all providers in the system are now unregistered, which is really interesting because that's not what we started with right at the beginning of this process. <laughs> Yeah, well, there was a lot yeah. of pressure to register. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think um, we should uh, fight strongly not to have that uh, re compulsory registration board in. Thank you, David. Anyone else? Jerry? Yeah, I completely agree with what David just said. I, I mean, recently uh, I had experience of that too, where I had to completely replace all my shoes to go with my KFO. And one of the companies that I was dealing with said, sorry, we can't help you, even though they had exactly the product I needed um, because I couldn't utilise that with my plan because I'm not self-funded, I'm NDIA funded. So I didn't have the choice to be able to do that. And they said, we're just not interested in becoming registered or dealing with the NDIS plans whatsoever because it's just... Too much yeah. hassle and too scary. And they were the exact words they used with me over the phone. And I just went, oh, wow. So I had to go elsewhere. Luckily, I found somewhere, but that was really a difficult process. It, it, because when you're buying um, that sort of a product, you really need a very specific product because you've got two different size feet you're dealing with suddenly. And that's one less person that do offer the excess that just can't, aren't interested yeah. in helping any of those people. And I understand, I understand there, you know, I can put myself in their shoes, I get it. So it's just a, a little bit of a look at that. And those stories, Jerry, yours and David's, and probably the ones we're about to hear as well, are ones we should be collecting and we might come back to you um, okay. so that we can write this, you know, give examples of where this might be problematic. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep. 
I think there's Claire and Diane. Yeah. Don't worry yeah. about me. Don't worry oh. about me because as David said it at the start. Forget about it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Uh, yeah, I agree as well. I have a son with a spinal cord injury who uses support workers um, in in various ways, but for his personal care, and it's something that you know for him he would need to be, use, be using registered providers um, at the moment. We do a lot of um, our own education and training, which um, we we think is adequate, but I think that will change in terms of this registration process and and who he'll be able to work with. But you know, I I think in in some ways that it's good to have the oversight, and I understand why the NDIs are wanting to go down this route. I think there's quite a bit of fraud going on, and, and they don't have visibility of of where money is going and and who's working in the system of, of you know those hundred and sixty thousand unregistered providers. So yeah, I think it'll be very interesting to see how this turns out. And I, I know I, I don't think you've mentioned yet the uh, task force that uh, Bill yeah. Shorten mentioned earlier this week, which um, will be. Yeah. Uh, run by Natalie Wade heading heading that up and I think as a person with disability herself that will mm -hmm. be really um, very much taking all of those opinions of everyone in uh, who has a disability and making sure that they're they're heard in in regards to what they do in in this instance so I think that will be yeah a really great step and I think they've got six, six months to to be collating a report on that so that that will be definitely one for us all to contribute to. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Claire, do you think you can send that information through to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, the the other thing I was going to mention quickly was the other thing I listened to. I'm not sure if anyone else is aware of uh, Dr. George's yes. podcast on reasonable really and necessary. Um, yep. He just put up one which is all talking about the a lot of these okay. things, the, the risk proportionate registration, um, the one to three ratios mm. in housing. So I'll okay. pop that up in the chat as well here because I think that's um, definitely yes. one for everyone. That was have really on. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Robin. Robin. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess I just want to express my concern that I it, it really takes away from a participant's choice and control really. Because there'll be, you know, I'm just thinking I'm I'm an NDIs participant and I self-manage my my plan, and I can choose um, my gardener and my cleaner, and I gather they would come under, you know, the lowest risk supports. Um, but you know, I don't know if they're going to, you know, jump through whatever hoops there are going to be um, invented. Um, for them to become registered. Um, I mean, it's a bit hard. We don't know. It's not clear yet because these are only recommendations as to, uh, you know, there. I'm assuming they're going to be, well, there'll be different, that there are the different levels of registration, but, you know, what's, what's, what's it going to entail um, for those lowest risk supports? So, you know, it means I, personally I won't, you know, if they choose not to register, then I'm not going to have that choice. Um, I'm, my choices are going to be limited a lot, I think. And for people living in regional areas where the choices are already limited, you know, that those choices might be non-existent. And that concerns me. I, I keep going on mute. mute. I was going to say, not to mention that a lot of the carers um, in the sector are also from a non-English speaking background as well. Um, by this because a lot of the carers actually do fit into that space mm -hmm. as well. Okay. I still see the hand that David has. I don't know if it's the previous oh. one. Or... Yeah, thank you. Um, look, this is a, digressing a little bit, but I'm just wondering, uh, I, I, like Robin, are self-managed and I feel that I was very fortunate to be put in that category when I first received the NDIA uh, or NDIS uh, assistance after my yep. accident six years ago. But I'm wondering how hard it is for people who are not self-managed to actually transfer to being self-managed because 
I personally think it's a much better system and mm. I have not had much success with people advocating on my behalf, apart from SCIA, who have been wonderful, but as far as providers go, I, I think I can do a better job myself. And um, I'm sure there'd be a lot of other people in this category. Yeah, like a th I think quite a, about a third. Yeah. I think are actually self aging. And some of them are, are carers as well who are looking after children and others are people with disability. But I mean, a lot of people who are perhaps parents of a child with uh, yes. disability, uh, surely they should be given the option of becoming self-managed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and there should be provision for people who are not self-managed to actually transfer and become self-managed. Mm. Are there any other? Thank you, David. Thank you, Jared. Jared. Jared yeah, I, I was going to comment on that too. I've actually had that 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 same issue concerned with my own plan, and I've heard other people in our area. So I still don't understand why I be. I mean, I'm very cognitively capable. I'm I'm highly intelligent. I'm. Uh, I've got a really good background in self-advocacy now and I still don't understand. I've never had it explained to me why I can't um, manage my own funds. Um, I did ask okay. a year ago. At first I was okay with it. I don't really understand why I wasn't allowed to. So there actually was never an explanation as to why. Mm -hmm. And my support coordinator at the time, the lovely Maggie May, who sadly I don't have anymore, but I have a little lovely new support coordinator, um, mm -hmm. I don't think they ever gave her a reason either. We never knew, so we sort of didn't didn't worry too much. Um, you have always got the option as a uh, a non self funded person to to get non registered and registered people within your fifteen hundred dollar limit. And yeah. I've learned to utilise that portion, but it's a shame that you know you haven't got a little bit more control. And and again, like David said, why you can't be have that ability mm. to transfer a lot easier because I found it extremely difficult. Um, you just need a basically a blank wall. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, just on Jerry's there. Um, Jerry, when I was I was heavily involved with NDIS in the regional area here in Bathurst and that, and they when it first started, they they were very adamant adamant about um, servicing your own. Now that was a because we asked. Um, from an Aboriginal perspective, we, uh, you know, First Nations, we had to ask them a question. They were questions, and they've said very much that, and I remember very clearly that you're out allowed to do self-providing uh, and stuff like that, what you're talking exactly what you're talking about. And I remember it very clearly. So I don't know why you're not allowed to do it because it was. I remember it very clearly mm. when it first started off. Yeah, I don't. I've never been given an answer why, and yet we did. We did ask. We had. I had mm. a review two years ago, and I'm currently going through another review. Um, for my funding of my sea brace and mm. more support because it was underfunded. Um, and I remembered mm. I joined in 2018 and it took nearly 18 months to get onto the NDIS because we had like a cyclic and information data issue. Once that got sorted out, I just literally was put straight onto um, NDI managed and never managed to go back. So, yeah, mm. I don't know why it was never offered. Well, it should have been. All I know is it yeah, should have been. Yeah, yeah it, it, it was because um, we had big forums here here in Bathurst. We had one here in Cowra, Bathurst and Orange. And from a First Nations perspective, that was needed to know. That was a need to know. And they told us that, yes, you can. So I don't know why you was knocked back or even not even put, you know, um, no. given, the, given the option. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it would have been good because I, I, I think I could have done it. I think I'd be very good at it. It's successful, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Jerry, I might have a chat with you later about mm -hmm. that as well to see um, to okay. see if we can do anything in the individual advocacy space. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Okay. Um, Gordana, there is David and Robin. Okay, and then after and that, I think yeah. we need to move on. Yeah. <laughs> and Tanya wrote something in the chat. David. I think, from my perspective, I'm very naive, but um, I'm cognitively sound, very. But I'm like a bit like Jerry. I'm finding that since I've been in care, people that care for me expect that oh, he's got a disability, therefore it's a mental disability. Mm. Can't think for himself. Yeah. Can't do much for himself. 
Okay. That's the general feel. I don't see it as me being okay. I'm just going to say it's a mental thing. That's what I like. They want to take care of me. Mm. You know, mm. letting you be independent to the point where they support you. It's if it's to support you, take care of you. Mm. But that's it. Care role, support role. Interestingly, David, that does come up in the um, aged care review as well, um, and and more um, listening to people um, and having people involved. Yeah. So I think that's something we can. I think I've heard that a lot, and it's a really good point. We can amp talk about that in the aged care space as well. Okay. Liala, did you say there was somebody else? I've got two uh, more people. Marka? Yeah, Marka Robin. Oh, yeah, with the um, uh, Jerry, uh, perhaps I suggest um, using your capacity building budget to build a capacity up to uh, to be able to manage, and then um, and then okay. perhaps uh, transition across to to managing your own package because it does show that you're demonstrating and you're learning, and plus you get training, okay. and they cannot deny you from um, managing your own package. Uh, mm. But uh, yeah, perhaps oh, that Thanks, might be Mark. a way That's forward. Good. That's a great idea, Mark. Robin? Robin. Yeah. yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I was just going to say to Jerry and whoever else is listening, um, in a cynical way, sometimes it just it gets down to the planner who's mm. who's setting your plan, unfortunately. Um, and I think what Mark suggested is is um, yeah, having to demonstrate, you know, your abilities and selling yourself, which is mm. just tiring and exhausting most of the time um, but certainly getting advocacy from from scare I think individual advocacy some some pointers on mm. how to approach your and next you can, review. you can also do a step down which is you can manage your consumables yep. and assist the technology and then perhaps do that for six months and then they get another review and then step down again to uh, the full review but oh, there's still some tactics mm. you can use mm. great well, thank you for that. I'm just going to skip this um, a bit of, oh, the only bit of this that I wanted to talk to you about is once again to remember that this is still um, just a plan in progress. Um, I also wanted to tell you that Tony has provided submissions and input into the Royal Commission on into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. He's also written to the Housing Minister about New South Wales failing to adopt the National Code and we've I've been involved in the National Disability Australia's Priority Projects workshops and town hall briefings and also all Australians matter town hall briefings to provide input into their responses. And we'll continue to work with the Physical Disability Council of New South Wales in Australia with in the areas that they're actually covering. And the reason why I mentioned the Royal Commission here as well is because there's a lot of overlap between the two, between the NDIS review and the Royal Commission. So now I'm actually going to hand over to um, Susie, who's going to take us through the aged care. There you go. Over to you, Susie. Okay, thank you, Gordana. Sorry, I was just um, replying on the chat and distracted momentarily, so get rid of that so I'm not distracted. So I'm going to be quite quick on this. And before I start, I want to acknowledge the enormous amount of knowledge in the room. So when I started in here, as I said, my background is not disability advocacy, but it is advocacy. So rest assured, you will be in good hands as a team. Um, and I had this wonderful plan of learning everything in, in the last eight weeks or six weeks. Unfortunately, life doesn't didn't give me that. And I've been on leave more or less ever since. So please jump in. Um, please share your knowledge as well. Um, your knowledge is enormous. This is an enormous issue for us. I do know that. It's a big issue for our people. Um, aged care and disability is something we need to step up on this year. Um, we have an opportunity to um, with some of the changes in the next you know, year and even two years. Um, so I really can't, I really value the feedback of the people in this room and acknowledge that some of you are going to know a lot. I'm also going to be really quick on this because I think, you know, in March 2021, um, the Royal Commission um, into Aged Care and Safety um, was um, tabled in Parliament. And so we know this has been around for quite a few years. We know about this. 
Um, the changes were categorized into six key outcome areas. Um, they're the outcome areas that are listed on your screen. Um, and, you know, a lot of them, uh, you know, for example, respect, um, that is like what you were saying, David, that is having older persons participating in decision making. Um, stronger, um, stronger controls around restrictive practices, which SCIA has advocated for, really critical things. Um, real choice and control. Again, it's something we've been talking about today, and it's about p allowing people to manage their own care. So it's not just under the NDIS, it's managing their own care and having information available to do that um, so that people know how to manage their own care. Safe and high quality care, well-trained people. Um, independence through care at home, which is really relevant to people. We, we don't want People don't want to be in nursing homes where they don't need to be. So having high quality care at home, um, that's um, the new support at home program, um, care management funded separately to service provision. Um, there's also easy, consistent, equitable access. So we still are going to have um, the single point of entry for government funded services and appropriately skilled care, like valuing the workers who provide our care um, and training and recruiting the workers who provide our care. So it's like a really quick skip through in the interest of time um, of, of those issues. Um, mo most importantly is what's going on now. Um, at the moment, many of you have seen, I know a couple of you have, so I've spoken to I think one or two people um, about the exposure draft for the UH Care Act. This is really important because it is creating rights-based legislation that um, includes a greater focus on safety and on well-being um, and on the well-being of older people. So it's, it is a really important document. It doesn't, though, get to the heart of some of the things that we want to advocate on. That's coming a little bit later. The recommendations are for stronger whistleblower protections. Um, new standards have been added. Um, and there's currently guidelines being drafted. Um, pending the path of legislation, the new act will commence this year on July 1st. Um, so we've actually written a submission um, for this. SCI has written a submission. Um, and with this, I guess the three things we chose to focus on, the first one being, um, I can see you, Mark, but I'll just finish what we've written on and then I'll, go, I'll jump to you if that's OK. Um, um, the first one being um, advocacy is not mentioned in the um, Draft Exposure Act um, and it was in the previous legislation. So one of the things that we spoke up about was to say advocacy needs to be mentioned. There's multiple points of vulnerability in the system um, and we need to talk, mention the critical importance of advocacy and also the funding of advocacy. The second thing that we spoke about is the naming of disability, complex disability under the Act. Um, so at the moment, um, the, the language is frail, sick or ill, but given that is a requirement for um, people with complex or with disability to utilise the aged care system, it's really important that disability is named in there. Um, and even though the um, my, my reading of the exposure bill is that um, it's not the space to comment on the parity between the NDIS and um, aged care, that's going to come up in the next round of consultations. Um, we st I still made sure we mentioned that because you can't mention that enough. Um, mm. We also raised the importance of, of the role of assistive technology. Um, and like the issue of parity and funding, it's probably not quite the space because it's going to be the next round of consultations where we can talk about that. But it should be explicitly mentioned in the Act that AT should be prioritised as early intervention for people over 65 because it is really critical to ensuring independence. So they were the three key areas that we focused on. Um, in our submission, um, and I did invite comments along the way. So I'm going to throw to you, Mark, to comment before I keep talking. Oh, yes. Is the submission available? Yes. Uh, for public? Oh, okay. Yep. And where yep. can we so, find it? Um, so it's available, as I said, I'm really, I have to commend Gordana and Liala and Diane for sort of operating 
solo while I unfortunately had to take a lot of leave over the last couple of weeks. It can go, it will go up on the website if you have under advocacy, you can see there's the past submissions, but Mark, it's not there yet. Um, just because of my poor attendance um, and my family situation. Um, so yes, we can send a copy. We can also make it available on the website in the next week. So keep your eyes on, on that. And second question um, is, um, yeah. does this work cover the, the age bracket between 50 and uh, 70, uh, which kind of borders the NDIS and aged care? Or is it more and mainly just focus on aged care? My understanding, Mark, and again, this is where I'm going to throw to people in the room because I've been playing catch up on the weekends, um, trying to understand this legislation as well, is that this is only relating to aged care um, and it's the new Aged Care Act. So that space, which I know, Diane is very relevant to the work that you do um, and probably why you just put up your hand, I don't yeah. think is covered by this. But Peter, I don't know, before we go to Diane, if you... Can comment on that? Are you talking about talking to Peter Randall? Peter? I am. Oh, yes. Yeah. I saw you <laughs> put your you. hand up. I thought, Peter, you might be able to answer Mark's comment. <laughs> um, well, no, I can't answer that okay. particular question. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. But I would just like to comment on something you said that uh, you can't um, raise often enough mm -hmm. the problem of people with disability and therefore uh, higher care needs being shoveled into an aged care system, which is for people who are frail aged. It does not meet the needs of people with disability, and yet they're forced into them by a government decision that they cannot be, that they should not be entered into the NDIS. Mm. Um, and the aged care review was quite adamant on this in their, in their uh, recommendation 72, that people with a disability should be accommodated in the aged care system with supports uh, in uh, care and technological supports that are equivalent to those that they would have enjoyed if they'd been in the NDIS. And that they couldn't have said it more clearly. And yet uh, the uh, people that I've contacted, the minister and the Department of um, Health, have just skated around this problem as if it mm. didn't exist. Mm. And I think that uh, uh, what you what you've said is that we can't raise it more often enough, even though yep. maybe it'll be re addressed in the future, but the future is is too far away. So, so you're, you're absolutely right, Peter and Dan, I haven't forgotten you, by the way, um, but you're absolutely right. So my understanding and Mark, I know we haven't answered your question directly. I think it is outside of the scope of this. Um, I'm happy to talk to you offline about how we can raise that issue though. Um, the exposure bill is still open. Um, it was extended, I think it's March four or five. Um, and I think at PT, you yes, did, or yes. someone put a submission in, mm. encourage you to put in individual submissions as well, even though it is outside of the scope. Um, I believe there will be consultation opening soon for the support at home program where we will have a lot of space to raise this issue of parity mm -hmm. um, and AT. Um, and so what we are wanting to do, and I'm so conscious of time um, for this meeting, and um, what we are wanting to do is hear from you and collect your stories. We've done it all along but we haven't done it as well as we can, especially about this issue. Um, so Gordana will be sharing before we finish up our sort of our plans for better representative advocacy advisory groups to hear your stories, Peter, because the personal stories of this over 65, this lack of parity, it's completely unfair. Mm. Um, so we want to be ready and on the front foot for this one um, for when we can comment on the support at home program. Um, and Diane, just quickly, because I've noticed we're really running out of time, but I don't want to lose your comment either. It's okay, Peter sort of hit hit the nail on the head where I was coming mm. from, but it's just from a First Nations point of view, so it doesn't yeah. bother. Okay. It's it's critical and, and we are very aware of it. More or less what I was going to say, Susie, in the Aboriginal uh, First Nations is we like to keep our people um, aged people care home, you know, um, in the house, in homes uh, mm. where they're f familiar to. And I think that should be not just for Aboriginal, but it should be, should be for everybody mm, because yes. who wants to be moved out of their home just because they're aged? That's wrong. Yeah. Okay. Look, it's an absolute no-brainer. If someone becomes 
or has a spinal cord injury as is relevant to this particular um, organization. Someone has a relevant, um, sorry, a spinal cord issue, injury when they're age 65 or beyond, and then is denied NDIS support. That is just unbelievably unfair and needs to be hounded to the nth degree. It does. Mm. Yeah. I it does. agree. And um, we, we absolutely, this is the year for doing mm. that because the, uh, and I, I want to sort of wind up this section so we have time for sharing some other things, but this with the home, new home support program consultations that will mm. come up, um, we really want to get the voices of people like you, Peter, um, like da David L, I think, yes. um, and making yep. sure we're animating your voices in some sub submissions. Um, so, I'm going to rush through these last two slides because I think that the critical thing for our people and what you're saying to right now is let's get our voice really clear on the parity issue, the naming of disability in the Aged Care Act, assuming that we can't have people on the NDIS, so we, we try and do that, um, and, and the AT. Um, and so, um, yeah, let's, let's work on that and amplifying your voice. Um, where the system's being staged. Um, the, the role it's being staged, um, it's just being staged because of the large number of organisations and the large number of people that need to transition through it. Something like 800,000 older people transitioning, um, 1,500 providers, um, there's risks of IT, there's risks of change. All current providers will be deemed into the new model, so there shouldn't be any changes in service provision. As you can see, single assessment tool system commences in July 24. July 25, the new support at home replaces support care packages and short-term restorative care. So this that's our space for our advocacy, as I understand it. Um, and then from July 27, the Commonwealth Home Care Support Program transitions into support at home. Um, agreed, whoever just said that um, in the chat, it would be, that is important. Um, why uh, we've done that, why the staged approach? Um, um, I think just to give time for the state and territory governments to assist with technology loan schemes um, to allow consultation, which is what we need with service providers. So, Gordana, let's just skip through so we can yeah. chat about the other things. Other changes, um, it dropped off the first bullet point, but the promise is no more huge waiting lists, which is a really important <laughs> thing um, for people um, moving back into the community from a spinal unit. Um, higher level of co care at home is being considered. Again, this one's critical to our humans, which is why I didn't want to leave it. Um, we don't quite know who was interviewed um, for this. Um, and so this is something we need to advocate on quite a lot as well, because we may need to make sure people with a complex physical disability were interviewed for this process. Um, and so we're keen to keep advocating on that issue as well. Um, I'm going to skip Cordana through this sure. one um, because I know people have their hands up and I want to allow for people to talk um, or ask questions as well. Um, sure. David L. I was going to say, just adding on to Peter's um, comments, it's not only unfair, it's cruel. It is. Happening. Yeah, I agree. And that is something that is even mentally disabilitating. You become a bit dementia when you you know, let alone, you know, anything else. But when you're surrounded by yeah. dementia, that's what you become. Mm. Anyway, that's all I need to say. That's, that, that, sentence, that statement that you said, David, is a really, it's sad. It's also critically important for advocacy in this space um, to animate mm. that voice that you've got there to, to, yeah. um, to show the real life impact implications of this really unfair policy. I just want to say to everyone who's having to leave because we have hit time. Thank you yeah. every thank you everyone for your participation. It's we can stay on and finish chatting to those with their hands up if they want to or we can call you back. Thank you though for everyone's participation. It's great to see all these faces today.